This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today, I'm pleased to deliver a two-part episode, two really interesting guests. First, Joey Ryman, who runs Bright House. Joey has been called the father of ideation. It's a term he coined, and he has emerged as the subject matter expert in the area of purpose-inspired leadership, marketing, and innovation. His breakthrough purpose methodology and frameworks have been adopted by the likes of the Boston Consulting Group, Procter & Gamble, the Coca-Cola Company, McDonald's, KPMG, and many other Fortune 500 companies across the globe. He is an adjunct professor at Emory University and teaches tomorrow's executives his revolutionary theories and applications for purpose-inspired profit. I saw one of Joey's books for the first time years ago called Thinking for a Living. There are still some classic lines in that book that inspired me. My second guest today is John Brankus. John is the host of the ESPN TV show, Sports Science. Now, when I say that right off the bat, even if you're not familiar with John's show, and millions are, the idea of sport and science, anything with science, inspires me. It also just happens that I grew up in the same city with John. We played baseball against each other. I can't say that we were really good friends as young guys, basically the same age, but we knew each other for sure. Now, the funny thing was, I was good friends of John's parents. Crazy, crazy small world. And John started with basically nothing, absolutely nothing. And through a lot of hard work, he's got one of the most popular shows on ESPN. Every great athlete wants to be on that show. Go check out some of the YouTube clips. Just really cool stuff. And I thought both of these men, as a combination episode, that real kind of motivation, if you're thinking, I can't do something, I can't do it, I thought both of these guys combined made a really great episode. I hope you enjoy. People should have their mission, their passion, their goal. Why, Joey, were you born? Yeah, great question. Well, you know, the the question I'm with, the, the answer to that question is really another question, which is, which is really our quest in life. We spend the rest of our lives after we're born trying to find out why. And as Mark Twain said, the two best days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. I mean, I was born you know, to, to to help people find their own purpose and to to empower people. That's clear to me, but but that wasn't clear to me when I was 12 years old. Um, I, I think we spend our lives looking for that meaning, and in looking for the meaning, we become happy. I'm not a big believer in the pursuit of happiness because I don't think that happiness can be pursued. I think happiness is ensued. So the search for meaning then becomes the better path than looking for happiness. And looking for your why is a, is a, is an incredible, uh, a ways out of an incredible, wonderful path where people become much more patient than they ever have been because they're searching for something truly genuine that, 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 and, and they focus much more on, on, on finding it than, than, the sense of losing it because you never lose your purpose ever but finding it that's the genius of 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 life you know i, I excuse me for throwing right at your solar plexus the big question right out of the gate that's no that's not uh, you you hit my heart not my solar plexus i don't i don't uh, that's a great question and it's a question that everyone needs to ask themselves and because when you find your why, every who in your life becomes much more valuable. Every what in your life becomes much more genuine. Every where in your life uh, becomes richer. So the, the why is that that's 
question, Michael, is, is the most important question anyone could ask themselves. Let me ask you, so as you talk about being a teacher and, and helping others, that's a tough question for a lot of people, obviously, and I think it sounds like, in doing my homework, you have made good strides on figuring out your why. When you help other people to come to that understanding or any kind of advice that you can give, what are some of the big areas that people either trip up on or pieces of wisdom that you can pass along to people to help them move down the path farther? Yeah, great question. Let me answer it uh, two ways, uh, the long way and the short way. The long way is to do what Aristotle told us all to do, which is to to find that intersection between our unique gifts and the needs of the world. He said where, where our distinctive talents or our unique gifts intersect with the needs of the world, there lies your vocare, which is Latin for calling, which in my language means purpose. So, that, again, at the intersection of your happiness, your gladness, and the world's madness and sadness, there lies your, 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 your calling or your purpose. The way to do that, actually, is um, I've developed a framework called the four eyes, investigation, incubation, uh, illumination, and then illustration. And what, what the, the shorthand of that is to go back to your beginnings. Everyone needs to go back to their, their early years. And, and really, the way I encourage people to do this is to look at their baby books and find out what they were doing and what they loved doing when they were children. Um, because most of us are de genius by the time we're in fourth grade, and most children forget what they loved, and adults, in a way, become corpses uh, of, of what they were as, ch- as children. And then, once we identify what we love or where the light was, we look out into the world, and it doesn't have to be the larger world, it could be just your world, and see where the needs are. And at that intersection, then, starts to... to, to at that place, we find the beginnings of, of the articulated purpose. And once we uh, once we find that light and find that purpose and find that feeling, the important thing to do is to take that light into all the other places in our lives, at, at work and family, wherever wherever it is. And and that that can be quite the revelation and quite the revelry. If you're not up for that task. I often tell people, what would you put, what, what would you, if, if you could have a t-shirt, what, what, what would you write on your t-shirt that best expresses who you are? That's the, that's the cliff note version, the spark note version of actually doing a lot of homework. And it really, you know, when I say homework, it really is homework in the sense that you have to find what, you have to find your home. You have to find, where you feel that peace, where you feel that light, where you feel at home, and then take that, again, take that spark, that instructive spark of fire, and shine it in all the other places of your life. Because to try to go to places that you're not happy in and bring light and happiness to it by staying in that place, that never works. But by going to a place where you find that love and light and then bringing it to another place, that always works. So, so those are, those are two answers. One's long and takes, uh, would take about a week probably <laughs> for most people. The other takes about five minutes. And it's, it's a great exercise. Uh, they're both great exercises. Obviously, I've seen your work for a long time, and, and your book, Thinking for a Living, really inspired me many years ago. And as the author of five books... I've had some voices and I'm working on a new project and I've been in this process of assembling information, research and a little bit of incubation, a little bit of illumination, but not really the illustration part yet. Right. But I have outside voices that are distractions. And what's really interesting is to watch them is for the general population, even the general business population, they really don't like this idea of sitting back and contemplating and investigating. They just want you to produce a product. It doesn't make a difference if the product's terrible. They just want something produced. And so when I saw your four steps the other day, which I had seen years ago, but then I re-saw them and I was like, oh, it just made me feel calm. I was like, okay, no more voices. They're all turned off. I have a process that I've been reminded of and I feel calm. Yeah. Well, it's very kind. I, I, I let me let me address the outside voices. You know, the outside voices can be 
incredibly destructive because they come from a place that is not, as you said, well, you said outside, they're not inside. The outside voices are usually from our parents, our peers, our professors, teachers. They're voices from the past that lay down, um, uh, that actually create a structure for people early in their lives where these people become actually maladapted uh, because of these voices. They're, so it's very important to keep, it's very important to, um, to keep those voices out and listen to your, to the inner voice. And that's where the calmness comes from. Again, you know, um, calm is, is it, calm is the new black, I, I guess. It's, uh, people strive for that. And that can only happen by going inside and not outside. And everyone's looking, of course, for the ideas outside. And as you said, they're looking for ideas quickly. Contemplation is a very powerful notion. It doesn't mean being alone. You know, solitude and aloneness are very two very different things. And, you know, the great philosopher Pascal, he said that every problem known to mankind and to womankind for that matter it all comes down to not being able to be alone with oneself. So I think we should listen to Pascal and work on that. And, and the way to think about that is to think more about contemplation than aloneness. Because one is, one is very exciting and the other is very anxiety-producing. And I've seen in your work you saying money doesn't create ideas, ideas create money. But if I think about the typical environments that most people expect, and I'm – I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years. I can't remember the last time I worked for somebody, and I, I, I just don't exist in that environment. So sometimes it's hard for me to relate. So, But if I think about the typical environment that most people are exposed to, we're really talking, I'm not saying this to be mean or nasty, but we're talking about office cube environments. We're talking about you know maybe suits that don't fit well or a tie that doesn't fit well and, and you know, a computer screen in front of you. How does the, the typical environment, how can people even be creative in that typical environment? I've seen you say, if you walk into the room and someone's got their feet kicked up on their desk and they're daydreaming, that's not necessarily a bad thing to you. For a lot of people, it's a bad thing. No, uh, daydreaming in the old days was a punitive, pejorative term. And in the new day, it's a, it's a requirement. You know, all creativity is based on unconditional creative, being in an environment where, where the response need not be conditional. It's all, creativity really is, is a result of an unconditional environment. Not, as you said, Michael, you're talking about a typical office. A typical office does not breed creativity. A typical office is based on, there's actually office buildings and offices were modeled after prisons. This is where we, I mean, that's where we get the idea of cubicles and, and, and everything in the office was based on the prison, a prison architecture. So most offices are prisons. And, um, I often tell people, if you want to think outside the box, which is this cliche of creativity, the box is not your brain. The box is your office. So don't, don't, Stay in the office. Go to stay in your car longer. Go to stay on the john longer. Take longer showers. Uh, take longer walks. And 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 now this I'm Jewish, but I I, I prefer thinking inside a church because I think the church arch- architecture actually is conducive to to divine intervention, to to ideas, and that, that's where I go often. I I, I don't I don't spend a whole lot of time in the office. I don't encourage people to spend a whole lot of time in the office and I and I would encourage your listeners to um, to rethink the notion of the cubicle as a cube that kills because when I hear cubicle, I that's what I hear. I, I hear a, cu- a, a killing cube <laughs> and uh, it is a very it's a sad um, response I think on, on on humanity's architecture to have created these boxes uh, these, these pigeonholes, if you will, that uh, where people uh, are, are slowly withering away versus going outside. I mean, outside. I mean, God. I I teach at um, you know I've been teaching at Emory at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia for 
for the last decade, and every chance I get, I take my students outside um, because that's where the learning is. It's not. It's not. The classroom is not a classroom. Mm. <laughs> it, is, it is an unclassy environment. You know what I've I've found in my situation. Uh, travel is huge, but not only just travel, it's the sheer act of, of seeing something different or interacting with someone different, even if the conversation has nothing to do with what you might be working on for your creative endeavor or idea, but the sheer act of something different or new, individual place, scenery, it, that stimulation, and I don't know if you've done work on it, but that stimulation for me is huge. And I and I'm, I forget too, and sometimes I just have to force myself to go find the new, and it, it, it's almost like a burst of energy that happens too. You're so right. You know, I when, when I talk about how to change the world, I just tell people to change their routine because that will change the world, at, their, at least their world. And and also, a great trick for creativity is to ask yourself a question and then buy a magazine and then slip through the magazine with the lens. With you, Keeping that question in, in your mind, but using the lens of the magazine, the ads, the articles, to actually jog your 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 brain, if you will, and, and think about different ways of answering the question. So you're absolutely right. You know, we're only, our outputs are only as good as our inputs. And, uh, the more inputs you have, the greater output you'll, you'll, you'll create. I mean, nobody, when people say, I can't think in a vacuum, what they're saying is not, they can't, they can't think with that oxygen. What they're saying is that their oxygen is the in- inputs that they're, they're, they're getting from the outside. As you've said, the routine is the enemy of innovation. The groove becomes the rut. Which becomes a grave. Yeah. Yeah, routinization is, uh, is the number one enemy of all creativity. And that's a hard one because we, we all like to be organized and we all like a routine and we all like ritual. But if you're going to have a creative life, which is, and by the way, creativity is a lifestyle. It's not, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of living. Then you need to, to change it up. Uh, daily, and that, that doesn't mean dramatically or drastically. It might just mean change the way that you're going to work, and then change something at work, and you're going to find that work is a lot brighter and a, a lot nicer to you uh, if you if you change it up. Um, yeah, root, rootinization, big, um, big. Not big bad wolf. Yeah, that's that. <laughs> Listen, let me. Okay, so I've got this is kind of a two part type thing, but I want to th- to use some corporate examples for a moment. So I've seen you say that look, Apple is not about computers; they're a creativity company. Nike is not about shoes; Nike is about athletes. And then I've you know, and, and to and to add into that, you've I've seen you say, think with your heart as much as your mind. And so as I lay the foundation about talking about Apple and then mentioning Nike and about what they really do, it's not just a product. But I think about Apple versus Google. And Apple is there with the heart. And I think, you know, you go into an Apple store, you just feel that enthusiasm. But what's interesting when I look at Google, Google makes a lot of money. But I don't think anybody would say that Google is a is a heart company at least maybe their their opening splash page or am I reading that wrong or trying to make that compa- comparison or contrast between Apple and Google not to criticize but more as a learning e- uh, exercise? Well, you know, Apple is is right in front of our eyes and we use Apple. I mean, the stores are there. There are no Google stores, and you know, Apple was very very smart in in taking their marketing budget and and pumping it into their real estate. Because that's really where their marketing is happening. Uh, the, the genius bar, the fact that you can go up to anybody at Apple and you know they're smart, even if they're not, you just know they're smart. And if they're not smart, you still think they're smart. That's, that's some pretty sophisticated marketing. Google doesn't have that opportunity to be right in front of you other than a screen. So you're dealing with an inanimate, inanimate brand versus a brand that actually is not just animate, but it animates you. So, so Google did a little disadvantage. Now, the, uh, the upside of Google, uh, two two things. First of all, they're massive, they're pervasive, they're insidious. But their founders also wrote down three words when they started the company, and the three words were do no evil. And I think that, the, and what I believe and, uh, and think is that they are actually guided by those three words. They, uh, they, they could have done, they could be a, they could have, done horrible things and so far they haven't 
now they're making a lot of money, and you're right, we don't have the adoration that we have for Apple. But I think if they stick with this do no evil concept, it it will it it will help them and guide them and inspire them, and 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 hopefully not hurt us. But Apple clearly is. We're still having a big love affair, and there was a interesting study just done. Um, we looked, neuroscientists looked at the God part of the brain, and they they uh, they looked at blood flow in, in uh, MRI and MRIs, and um, noticed that the part of the brain that lights up when we think about God also lights up when we think about Apple, uh, which is depending on your listeners. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's but it's a, it's a it's a great lesson that in, in marketing that if you're a friend of your customer's excitement, you'll do well. And uh, I think that's the that's the learning from there. Just be a friend of their excitement. Yeah, that's really prescient. I mean, that's that's a really wise bit of advice for people to take in. I want to quote something from you: creativity. Inseparable from context, raw talent is less essential to creativity than a rich environment and receptive judges. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, you there's this all these constraints to creativity, but you're kind of pointing out, hold on, a rich environment, receptive judges, and the input isn't necessarily you're, you're you just keep trying and trying. But if you have some of these other things, a great environment and great colleagues, judges around you, that can be just as important, can it? Yeah, uh, the advice there I would give is surround yourself with yes people. You know, yes people are undervalued and underrated. They're, the world, no people have, have taken that concept public and they're, everywhere you go, someone's saying no or that can't happen or, you know, maybe next year. You need to surround yourself with lucky people and yes people. Lucky people, why? Because they're optimistic. Yes people, because, um, they will motivate, help motivate your craziest ideas. And by the way, you know, the reason yes people are so important is not for just the ideas or general, it's for the biggest, best ideas. Because when, because there's always violent opposition by mediocre minds to amazing ideas. And the amazing ideas are the ones that get, that, that get slaughtered by the no people. So absolutely. Think about the friends in your life. Think about your coworkers, and remove all the no people and the maybe people, and edit for the for the for the yes people and the lucky people. I like to hire lucky people because those people are the ones who are optimistic. They lucky people are lucky because they are more optimistic than people who think they're unlucky, <laughs> and that's a good headset and mindset. Uh, for for the people in your lives and the people at work. And once again, we're back to the power of thinking for a living. So much of what we're talking about today, so much of success, however one wants to define success, is in the mind. It's not on the paper. It's in the mind. It's how one thinks. Yeah. I um, In a former book, I wrote it. There's a chapter in one of my earlier books called Success or Success, and one is spelled with a C, and the other is a K after the C, uh, and I and and it's really a mindset whether you whether you feel that your life is a success or it just sucks. And the the the, the interesting thing about that is that you know in the Talmud there was a beautiful uh, a beautiful line in the Talmud which is we don't see things as they are we see things as we are, and that. And that is, that's a very important, it's a very important notion to always hold in your mind. Um, and, and because thoughts do have wings and, and we are our thoughts and thoughts are things. So it's very important to always have good thoughts and to t- retrain your mind to not listen to those voices you talked about earlier and, and have those positive thoughts and to have a thumbs up attitude. As you were talking about no people, I was thinking about something else that I've seen in your work. A concrete reason in my mind, and and I've actually planted bamboo and seen how bamboo grows and what can happen. Um, But as you know, that bamboo can take uh, four years to take root. The fifth year, it can grow 80 feet. 
And so you also note the power of slow is your secret weapon. And I think that's something as we talk about no people, I mean, maybe some of the no people have got some good reasons or rationales. But I think one of the in my life, one of the biggest things the no people don't see is they don't see that power of slow. Yeah, uh, no people don't know. <laughs> so that's the bottom line. And, 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 and the power of slow is, is, is really based um, on, the, on the rhythm of the world, or the rhythm of the universe. And, you know, we can learn so much from nature. And if we follow the four seasons instead of the four quarters uh, in business, if we look at our circadian r- rhythms and realize that we're supposed to be sleeping two times, in every 24-hour period, not one time. And we start focusing on sunsets versus bottom lines, we're going to we're going to uh, move differently. We're going to move much more slowly. We're not going to have short-termism or what I call quarterly capitalism. And by keeping a stereoscopic vision of the next quarter and the next quarter century, we're going to live richer lives and leave legacies, not just not just the notion of being a leg up on the competition. So the, the idea of business at the speed of molasses, which I call it, it's really not to downshift, actually, but to get in sync with the way that we're supposed to be living and take that way we're supposed to be living and bring it to work mm-hmm. so that it can work. And this is what I talk about. I, I talk a lot about this in my latest book, The Story of Purpose, which, which, is, a, which is a book about how companies can have greater purpose and subsequently greater profits. And by slowing down, we actually speed up. By going back to our origins, we actually have a sense and a, and a, and a sight of the future. So a lot of this is counterintuitive um, at first, but if you look at the way that we were brought up as human beings and the way that humanity has, has progressed over the, over the centuries, we start to recognize that, that in history, in our in our early nascent days in our history, we actually find our future. One last question for you, Joey, and I'd be amiss if I did not ask this one. Having you on storytelling for so many people out there, you know, writing or a storytelling. Maybe they don't even get to the point in their life where they they do this. Uh, as an author, I'm well aware of it, but I can still do a lot better. Why is storytelling so important? The reason storytelling is so important has to do with our prefrontal cortex. When we're born, we're, our brains are born actually with our prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brain, sub, actually empty. And subsequently, we spend our lives trying to fill that up, that part of our brain up, the part that is searching for meaning. We can live 40 days without, without uh, food. We can live four days without water. We can't live 30 seconds without searching for meaning. So we don't become storytellers. We are born storytellers. And that's why people love stories. Children love, they, they go, they, they're put to bed with stories. Um, they're taught stories in school. And then after we're degenius, we forget how important stories are. So, so the thing to remember is that human beings are meaning seeking creatures, always searching for meaning. And again, this goes back to the early part of our call, our our talk. If we're searching for happiness, that's not the same thing as searching for meaning. And 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 the rapture one finds in meaning really is is so much greater than the than the ephemeral the ephemeral feelings of happiness that go away. Joey, you really bring some uh, some fine wisdom. I appreciate you taking the time today. Hey, where's the, the, the best place for people to go? Uh, I, I believe it would be thinkbrighthouse.com? Yeah, it's, there's, um, it's, it's right, thinkbrighthouse.com. You can also get, I send out inspirational uh, notes every morning, and you can go to dailyjoey.com. That's dailyjoey.com. You can just, it's free. You get it every morning. Joey, thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. I love talking to Joey Ryman. I hope I can have him on again soon. Now, let me jump into my conversation with John Brinkus. Once again, John is the host of ESPN's Sports Science. If you've not seen it, check it out. Awesome stuff. I hope you enjoy my conversation with John. My primary thinking, obviously, I know you and I've known you for a long time. I know the family. 
But it was Michael Mobison, a longtime Wall Street strategist, who asked me a few years ago to connect with you. And he's a master at connecting trading and sport and the science of it all. And I just thought your story perfectly dovetails in because, I mean, the stuff that you've had a chance to get exposed to and, and approaching sport from a science perspective, I mean, we can't go in it all today, but there are so many dovetails into my world and the trading world. And I just thought it'd be a fun conversation. One of the great ones Michael's always talked about is something simple like Babe Ruth, which is the idea of frequency versus magnitude. You know, you could be a singles hitter, but you can be a home run hitter and it, you know, you can start to break all these things down. Here's where I want to go. How did you, I, I know something about how you got to where you are today, but what triggered the initial science and sport connection that's become your claim to fame? How did that happen? Well, we, so we have base productions is, the, is our production company, and we were specializing in two areas of television, Washington Wizards and Washington Capitals and a bunch of other teams around the country and science programming. We were doing lots of shows for the Discovery Channel, National Geographic. Discovery was launching their their channel. They called the Science Channel in D.C. And so we were located in D.C. So we were dabbling in sport programming and science programming, having expertise in both. We then put it all together in a show called XMA, Extreme Martial Arts, that we did for the Discovery Channel. That was the first show that put together sport and science for us. But it was kind of science light. Um, it didn't really go deeply into the science of everything. But that show was such a success on Discovery that National Geographic came along and said, hey, we want you to do that same thing, but science it up for us, make it even more science -y. What happened on Fight Science was we got the only, the only certified crash test dummy that we then modified to, um, so that human beings could punch it. And it was kind of the punch hurt around the entertainment industry where we had human beings punching and kicking the crap out of a crash test dummy. And that was the first time that really the light bulbs were, were going off for us. Like, oh my God, we can take pieces of technology that are out there and modify them to measure human performance in a way that no one's ever done that. So Fight Science was such a success on National Geographic. Fox owns National Geographic and they own Fox Sports. They ended up airing Fight Science opposite the original Peyton Manning versus Eli Manning Sunday night football game in the state. And Fight Science, uh, Fight Science did so well, it was their third highest rated program of the year with no promotion that they said, oh my God, we really, you really have something. So we then off of Fight Science created Sports Science and took the Fight Science approach and applied it to all sports. And really what we ended up doing was bringing in you know, pieces of technology that weren't necessarily sports related and adapting them to measure human performance in a way that had never been done. And, you know, now, you know, we ran for two years on Fox Sports, won a bunch of Emmys, and ESPN came along and um, essentially acquired sports science, and we're in season seven now, you know, six Emmys later and seven seasons later, you know, we're still going strong. Uh, okay, I'm going to jump around on you a little bit here. What's so cool about it is you surely, because I remember the first project you got started on, you did not start out to go this direction. And I want you to the best that you can, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but people don't understand the path of success is not a straight line. And you know, you you don't you don't necessarily know where it's going, but you follow a passion and things happen along the way. It's exactly what's happened in your world, isn't it? It really is. I mean, a lot of people say, how did you become the host of sports science? How did that happen? Really, the, the way that it ended up happening was I had to articulate a message of what the show actually was. And the general manager at the time of Fox, of Fox Sports, was, was saying, look, you're articulating this message so well. Why don't you be the host of it? And that obviously was completely unexpected and not <laughs> something that we, that we really ever planned for. But, you know, when you, when you think about it, you know, we own the company that makes the show. Sure, I, I articulate the message in a way that an audience can understand. You know, why not? And if it doesn't work out, it's not a big deal because I never planned on that working out anyway. So it, it was sort of a low risk proposition for me to become the host. But what, what you're really right about is that What's interesting is when you study the path of success 
for, you know, many individuals or companies. I, I love the phrase. I did an independent study with Steven Soderbergh, and Steven Soderbergh introduced me to the idea that talent plus persistence equals perceived luck. Be ready when it happens. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is it, what he really means by that is you have to try really hard, and you have to be good at what you're trying at. And if there are enough, if you get enough sort of iterations of trying something that you become pretty good at it, then so, that path can lead you somewhere. But what ends up happening is a lot of people, I feel like, have a vision ahead of time of, oh, I want to do X, and they're so focused on X, they're actually not good at enough different things to allow a path to open up to them. They're not open to that idea. It's like, you know, when people say, who's the ideal person for you to date? When you have that vision in your mind of, oh, she's got to be this tall with this hair, you know, with this background, you miss out on a lot of other great opportunities that could be a perfect match for you you just didn't know. You know, but John, if, if I go back in time, you went to a public Ivy in terms of colleges. This is not the way they trained you to think. The major was technically rhetoric and communication studies, which is the theory of the argument. And even when you look at sports science, I very much do utilize what I use in my major um, as a foundation of creating an argument. You know, you're taking the ethos, pathos, logos of sort of the argument itself. Who's saying it? What's the logic behind it? What's the emotional appeal behind it? Um, and when you look at sports science, I really do want to make an argument that's extraordinarily compelling. I want it to be an argument that you say, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that, and I don't have a real way of refuting it because it's such a compelling argument. So that, that's what I'm really setting out to do. Um, but in terms of, you know, there are two sides to what we do. Obviously, we have sports science and we have everything else because we're running a company. That, you know, sense of independence and being willing to take a chance and a risk, UVA actually did foster that sense in me and allow me to sort of craft my own major. I mean, it was a very sort of liberating experience. So go out, find experts, pick their brain for all that they have, and try to apply it to yourself in some way. Okay, let me keep picking a bone here. UVA did not teach you tenacity, though. Why are you tenacious? Yeah, see, I think I'm tenacious. I think that the sense, you know, growing up in Vienna, Virginia, I think really... It really, like, as you know, you know, you and I grew up in the same area. It was a very, you just simply did your best. That's what you did. And, you know, whether it was playing baseball or doing well in school or, you know, mowing lawns, like, you, you had to just do your best. That was, you know, really a sense of my parents instilled in me. The town felt like that. The, where I grew up, it felt like that. Um, and obviously you have your own DNA that, you know, is just the, sort of the way that you're wired. But I think that the way that I'm wired is certainly to always do my best. And that's, uh, you know, that sense definitely got, got nurtured through not only family, but where I grew up and where, where I went to school. And every turn that I took allowed me to flex that, you know, tenacious muscle, basically. Give me a few more, few thoughts about the idea of, I think your book was titled Perfection Point, the idea of physical limits being reached. Now, I watched I watched you do this piece with uh, uh, Wiggins, the kid coming out for the NBA draft this year. And, you know, it seems like there's another gazelle of human uh, extraordinaire performance coming out every year. But but you seem to you seem to make the, the postulate that, that we're going to reach limits and it can only you're you're not going to maybe necessarily get that much faster than Usain Bolt. Am I, am I going the right direction? Do we reach limits, or is there something crazy happen to us? Yeah, no, we definitely reach limits. When people say, you know, oh, well, in the 100-meter dash, someday, you know, we're going to run a six-second 100-meter dash, how do you know we won't? You know, when, when people want to make the argument that, you know, we are limitless, that keep progressing, it's just not true. I mean, we are, we will absolutely hit, hit limits because you can do, you can turn over leg based on stride length, stride frequency and distance. Um, you know, you can do the math on, on everything of, in human performance. And that's what the book is really about is there is a limit to everything. Now, part of the reason why some limits keep getting shattered, 
Um, and, you know, records keep getting it closed by big margins is because we haven't been doing it that long. When you look at something like the long jump, it, it, that's a, a perfect example. People say, well, Bob Beeman broke the world record by two feet in a single jump. The reality is we, we, we as humans haven't been doing the long jump for that long, and there aren't that many people worldwide who actually do it. That's why you can break the record by giant margins. Yeah. But on other things, like the marathon, we've been doing that for a really long time. We've been distance running for a long time. Lots of people have tried it uh, throughout history. So you're only going to shade tiny little increments off of the marathon at a time. You're not going to have any giant, giant strides made in a, in, a, in a single run. You know, it just depends on what the sport is, how long we've been doing it, but there, there absolutely are limits. Hey, listen, speaking of crash test dummies, you personally, in your episodes, uh, the Brandon Jacobs thing, if I'm not mistaken, you took a baseball to the groin as well. I mean, how many, I mean, Matt, you, you look, you look like you're losing your marbles a little bit there. I'm, I'm sorry. This is, there's, I mean, you got, I mean, it's taking some cojones to do some of the shit you're doing. Yeah. The, um, so I became the crash test dummy because we wanted the, the audience to be able to relate, to relate to an average person. And, you know, I'm five foot, eight and a half, 160 pounds. And I'm not, I'm not a spectacular athlete, but I'm not a terrible athlete. Hold on. You, 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 you've done, we're going to talk about that in a second. You've done the triathlon in Hawaii. So let's just knock off the not a good athlete part. So relative to people who do, you know, triathlons, relative to people who are really good at it. You know, I'm, I'm an, I, I consider myself an average athlete among people who are relatively good athletes. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I think the audience needs to see. I mean, obviously, yeah. totally average athlete is just somebody sitting on a couch, not exercising much, but that's not, that's the audience I think, um, yeah. wants to see. Yeah. I think they want to see someone that's, that's, you know, an average athlete. So yeah. the, uh, you know, putting myself in a harm's way is something that the audience can really appreciate and understand and really see the perspective in terms of how big, how strong, how fast elite athletes really are. Yeah. I, I just I think you know at the at the end of the day you know I look at my world so much of what I stumbled into in my world is about counting is about science and it's really the science of trading and I think there's there's so many people that have uh, and I, I'm not going in a religious direction but they almost have religious beliefs about whatever uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about religion but just they have these mystical beliefs about things and there's something refreshing and just nice when you apply science to almost any endeavor in life it's comforting it just makes you feel like oh I can understand that now a little bit I might not be able to do it myself personally but I can understand it science certainly does provide certainty in a way um, you know, but science, like everything, I think, I think almost provides a sense of security right now. As our knowledge evolves and as we learn more and as we open up doors that we didn't realize were there, the science evolves as well. And for whatever, for, for whatever reason, we are programmed, um, to sort of accept that and say, oh, well, the science has changed, but here's the new answer that must be absolutely correct. You know, there is security. But science, like everything else, does evolve. Theories change. Sure. Um, we learn new things. And that, that's just, that's, you know, that's how I want it to be. I don't ever want it to be such a certainty that it's not fun to explore and to challenge the theories themselves. No, I, I think probability and uncertainty is always going to be a part of the equation. Let me ask you one last thing. I'll let you run. Uh, the Iron Man. So what advice, if I'm not mistaken, what I read, you've done the Iron Man more than once? Yeah, I've done, I've done it five times now. In Hawaii, the big one. I've done the big one twice, and I've done um, other Ironman events three times. Okay, so but the the big one, no coaching in your life. You just kind of figured this out on your own. Yeah, I did it more as a dare because my best friend had run a marathon, and like all best friends do to each other, I said, "Wow, that's awesome! I bet I can do better than you." So, and I, I just tried to up the bar. Um, and when I took on the endeavor of doing the Ironman, I really didn't even know what it was. I didn't know what the distances were. You know, and I found out it's a 2.4 mile open water swim. I said, wow, that's hard. I don't even actually know how to swim. Then it was a 112 mile bike. I'm like, wow, that's hard. I don't own a bike. Then it was a 26.2 mile <laughs> run. I'm like, wow, I've never run more than five miles, but I'm going to do it anyways. So I, you know, I, I sort of got into shape and just sort of, 
you know, rolled the dice on it, betting that it's sort of the, I, if I were to say that I'm, that I'm, you know, good at anything, it's being stubborn and persistent. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to really focus and I'm going to be stubborn and persistent and I'm going to just keep going. Yeah. Um, you know, and as it turn, turns out, you, you know, uh, that works. It works, um, to be persistent and to, yeah. to just keep going. You know, when you put one foot in front of the other and just don't compromise and say, I'm not stopping until I reach the finish line, good things can happen along the way. I think that's a perfect spot to end it. Uh, I think our connection, just to give you a little technology perspective, this is, so I'm sitting in Saigon, Vietnam, calling you on Skype to a cell phone while you're driving somewhere in LA. So we have to deal with our, <laughs> <laughs> we have to deal with our, our issues as they come. But uh, listen, hey, best of wishes. And uh, when I make it out to LA sometime soon, we'll grab lunch. I think it's awesome. You've chosen this direction and I just love the persistence. And uh, I relate to a lot of that. Even if our, our worlds are different, that persistence, anybody that's an entrepreneur they, they they know where you're coming from so i love it i love the concept and uh best of luck awesome thanks man good talking to you again take care i see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up down and surprise markets whether new trader or experienced college student or financial advisor Protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money? Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.